So, yeah. And also one more thing to note about um, this slide also is this diagram I have here. So obviously you guys have maybe learned, I don't know how much you guys know about machine learning, right? But obviously you have artificial intelligence as this very, very broad field, right? And then machine learning is a, um, spare, is a subset within artificial intelligence. So a subset of those techniques. And then deep learning, which is about neural networks and all, neural network models, is then a subset of machine learning, right? So lots of NLP, uses deep learning and uses machine learning, but not all of it does. So that's kind of what this slide is illustrating where we will later be talking about NLP that involves deep learning, but there's a large amount of NLP that doesn't use deep learning as well. All right, and then I guess those of you are gonna talk about sentiment analysis. So if you guys don't know, this is one of the most common use cases of NLP in the, in the industry. So sentiment analysis is a binary classification task for natural language. And the idea is basically to kind of quantify like the positive or negative sentiment in input text. So if you have an example sentence like this, I really enjoy that movie. It was very funny. That's a positive statement, right? So we want our model to classify that as one. And then another example is, ew, I hated that meal. I would not recommend this for anyone, um, would be a negative statement. So you'd want to maybe class the model want to classify that as zero. So um, this is what this is really, really useful for is um, in the industry, it's really useful for analyzing customer feedback and then being able to monitor like brand reputation on social media live. So that way, you know, companies can figure out, you know, how to act on that feedback and to create like more profitable decisions, basically. So it's really, really powerful in the world of business. Next, we'll kind of talk about how um, language is kind of represented in the computer. So obviously, you know, um, words and like English language uh, carries a lot of meaning that is really, it's pretty difficult to actually represent meaningfully in the computer for um, models and math, sorry, mathematical algorithms to actually recognize, like basically use text as input. So these are some of the most common representations we that you see data scientists using. So the most like naive way of representing a word is using something called a bag of words model which is basically where you create a one-hot encoding for um, words. And if you don't know what a one-hot encoding, uh, one encoding is, uh, I can quickly explain. So let's say here we have um, a 1,000 word vocabulary, right? These are, these are 1,000 words that appear in our um, body of text we want to analyze, right? So basically, each word is going to be represented by a 1,000 a length uh, vector where there will be about, um, so the basically entire vector is going to be filled with zeros. And then there will be a single one in, this, in a position in that vector indicating what word that vector represents, if that makes any sense. I can also draw it out here. So like, let's say uh, you have this vector, right? So this first word th at the index zero indicates the word I. The next one is, uh, eat, and then the last word is cookies, okay? So right here, this vector I've kind of listed out right here represents the word eat, right? Um, if you wanted to represent the word cookies, you know, in this vocabulary, you would use this one hot encoding and then so on and so forth for the word I. But obviously this is a very, very naive example. So, you know, in the real world, these kind of vectors are like hundreds or thousands of, you know, numbers long. Yeah, so um, the next one is obviously basically expanding on the bag, bag of words model. And this is the idea of using something called n-grams. So, um, uh, you know, as we know in the English language, right? Words on their own versus words in a sentence, you know, surrounded by other words can carry a lot of different meaning, right? Um, this is the idea of context clues where, for example, if you look at a sentence, right? Um, and you didn't know a word in that sentence, you can kind of guess the, uh, the meaning of that word based on the surrounding words and its context within that sentence, right? So um, you basically not only want to encode single words, but you want to encode phrases from that sentence. So an n-gram is the idea of taking these like windows across a sentence and then not encoding the single word, but encoding those windows. So a bigram, is basically using windows of two, where you take I love, love data, data science, so on and so forth, and you encode these pairs of words as bag as uh, uh, 
uh, one hot encodings rather than the single words. And then this idea is kind of expanded to trigrams where you, instead of using a window of two, you use a window of three. And if that doesn't make, if my explanation there didn't make uh, enough sense, please stop me and um, like feel free to have me clarify it. Um, last but not least is word embeddings. So um, yeah, we'll kind of move on to that in the next slide. So what is a word embedding? For basically computers to process text, we kind of talked about how we need a numerical representation for the computer to actually use in, you know, computing math. So word embeddings are actually a high dimensional representation of words, um, basically like uh, vectors. So the idea of a word embedding is that we want to basically convert a word to a hundred dimensional or three hundred dimensional um, vector representation that has like really really useful properties for machine learning. And I can kind of show you guys like what I mean by like um, useful, like basically properties that word embeddings have that make them super useful. So right here is, um, so basically I kind of listed on this slide before uh, these word embedding types. So these are the most common pre-trained word embeddings used in the industry, word to vec glove, Elmo. Um, and there are some more as well. It's not by no means an exhaustive list. So right here, we're looking at um, a point cloud for word to vec. Okay, so basically, if we want to, let's let's put in a word here. So let's put in a word data. Okay, let's look up data. So right here, when we looked up data, these are the most similar words in this vector space. So information, instructions, file, um, algorithms, right? So basically, what I'm trying to say is that um, these word embeddings have really really special properties where similar words or words that are kind of in like this in, that are used in similar context will be very, very close together in this high dimensional space. Um, and I can kind of maybe, I guess, you know, uh, demonstrate that with another word here. I'll use finance, right? You can see that the most similar words in this vector space are banking, financial, commerce, business, investment, um, all things that you kind of associate with finance. So these are kind of just like um, really, really useful properties that word embeddings have that are really like basically allow machine learning models to perform better because of these like special properties. Now, also, if you guys want to play around with this link right here, uh, I'll send this to you. You guys can look up words and kind of like, you know, look at these sorts of stuff. Is, do you guys have any questions so far as well? If not, we'll move on. So, um, Basically, we'll next talk about dimensionality reduction. So this is where we're going to start talking about unsupervised machine learning. So the idea of dimensionality reduction is it's a form of machine learning where we want to learn a transformation that allows us to project data into a lower dimensional space. So right here, right, we were talking about how um, all of these words are typically in like 100 or 300 dimensional vector space. But for us to actually see it in this like in this three dimensional space, we actually had to project it into a lower dimensional space so that way we can visualize it, right? So that's actually right here. This is dimensionality reduction at work. So the reason why this is useful, right, is um, lower dimensional data is ex less expensive to keep, compute on. Like you basically will compute a hundred dimensional vector into a two dimensional or three dimensional vector, which could be pretty useful. It basically cuts down the amount of data you're processing um, which makes that easier. Um, another thing is we can also reduce the impact of redundant information in the data. And what that means is you might have, you know, certain, um, you know, vectors kind of providing the same information. And then we basically kind of reduce that clutter or that noise out. And then some of the most common algorithms that are used for dimensionality reduction are listed below here. So principal component analysis, singular value decomposition, t-stack, castic neighbor embeddings, and there's plenty, plenty more. Um, another useful prop thing that they can be used for is they can be used for pre-processing for machine learning models and or data visualization. So you guys kind of saw that in the projector.tensorflow link, uh, they can be used for data visualization. And I'll show you guys another example here. So this is um, my data hacks project that I did with um, Ayush, the DS3 president as well, a couple of uh, years ago. So. Uh, we basically had to take a bunch of survey questions and then um, convert them to work. Like we basically took those survey questions. We took, 
we looped through every word of the survey questions. Um, basically, and then take took the average uh, word embedding vector for that sentence, right? So each survey question is represented by a single word embedding. And then what we did was we applied dimensionality reduction to those like 100 dimensional word embeddings to, to project them back into two dimensional space, right? So that's why we're able to now visualize them in a two dimensional plot when they're originally hundreds of dimensions. And then you guys can kind of see that, you know, like um, what was really, really cool is that many of like the most similar categories of survey questions like diabetes, for example, were clustered together or um, yeah, I don't know why that part's not working, but you can kind of see that certain categories of questions were, were closer together because they were similar in content or they had basically similar word embeddings. So um, here we'll talk about also principal component analysis. So this is a um, dimensionality reduction technique. This is like one of the most foundational um, dimensionality reduction techniques that is used in data science. So the idea is you want to basically learn a transformation for um, data that you can use to project it by finding the top K principal components um, that capture the variance of the data. And the way that you find these like top K principal components is by computing a matrix of eigenvectors um, corresponding to the K largest eigenvalues. So basically a NumPy or whatever, right? You take whatever your input data is, you compute all the eigenvectors um, for that input data, and then you select like the top K eigenvectors of the highest eigenvalues. And then you can put those vectors into a matrix. And that right there is a projection matrix you can use. When basically, when you multiply any input data by that matrix, you can then project it into a k-dimensional space, if that makes sense. And uh, last but not, I mean, there's not last but not least, but like moving on, we also have clustering. So clustering is another unsupervised machine learning task where the idea is we basically give an algorithm unlabeled data and we want to, you know, separate um, these input vectors into groups. So, uh, you know, in this diagram, we can see that this data is originally unlabeled, and then we put it through like a k-means clustering algorithm, and then the algorithm figures out to separate these points from these points and these points from these points. It basically identifies these clusters or groups um, within the data. And then these are some of the most common algorithms that you guys can also look into for this as well. And also, guys, at any point, if uh, you guys get confused, feel free to you know unmute your mic or type in chat, and I will address any questions that um, you guys have. Because I know I'm going kind of fast, and this is also really complex stuff. But I'm also trying to keep it as like high level as possible to avoid much confusion. So if there's like if you guys have more detailed questions, let let me know. Next, la next, um, last but not least, for at least the unsupervised machine learning, is topic modeling. So topic modeling is an unsupervised machine learning technique used to encode documents into topic vectors. So um, top, uh, topic vectors are basically a vector of weights that correspond to words in the corpus vocabulary. So the idea is that each topic vector is a linear combination of the words in that vocabulary. Um, so what topic modeling essentially is, is another way of producing another like numerical representation of text, if that makes sense. It takes, it takes a document or, or basically like a um, paragraph or whatever, right? It takes a Wikipedia page, whatever, and then it'll convert it to a topic vector. And this vector can be used for all sorts of machine learning. So yeah, the, another um, really, really common use case for topic modeling is that you can then use this with a clustering algorithm to then cluster documents by similar topics. And then one of the most like common topic modeling algorithms that's used in the industry is called latent um, Dirchlik, I think is the um, pronunciation allocation models. So I think we also saw another question in chat. How do you test accuracy of clustering? So there are a couple metrics in machine learning that you use to evaluate models. So obviously, if you have, let's say in a, a perfect world, you actually had labels to this data and you just wanted to use clustering, right? You could do some sort of just like root, uh, like you could do some sort of like, um, basically, you could do some sort of accuracy um, metric, pay basically like, uh, you know, calculate the accuracy of your clustering algorithm. Another, I think the most popular way of actually, you know, um, getting the accuracy of the clustering algorithm is a um, 
is a what's it called it's a score called i think the homogen homogeneity score i think that's what it's called so it basically is a metric that kind of tell it, that quantifies how homogenous each cult cluster is like basically um are most clusters basically well separated from each other or well defined from each other it's a number or metric that encapsulates that so if you want to look into it look into homogeneity homo Homogeneity score, I think, is the way you pronounce it. Yeah, and then also, um, I forgot about this diagram here, right? Uh, this is kind of a diagram that goes along with topic modeling here. So let's say you kind of have, um, what's it called, a document here. The document is then represented by like a topic vector kind of represented by this here. And this is kind of what a topic vector would look like where you'd have like a word and then a weight corresponding to it, right? So this would be a topic mo of like a topic that kind of deals with genetics, a topic that deals with more like carbon based biology. This one deals with um, neurobiology. This one deals with computer science, right? So then you can basically sort um, these doc. You basically each document will then have a um, topic vector that then you can sort into these topics, if that makes sense. And here we can kind of talk about some of the, um, you know, libraries that you guys can use for like for machine learning. So scikit-learn is a really, really common library. It's covered in you guys' DSC class as well. Like you guys will use it for DSC 80 and then maybe it's like some classes later on in your upper division. Um, so the idea is this library has a lot of super useful unsupervised and supervised machine learning techniques. So you guys can do clustering, you guys can do dimensionality direction, you guys can do regression. Um, support vector machines, all sorts of stuff on this library. And it's super, super useful and super easy to pick up. So if you've never used it before and want to learn some machine learning, like just start reading through the documentation. It's pretty hard. It's pretty easy to pick up as well. Um, next, we also have some like NLP libraries. So these are some of the, these are I think the three most commonly used NLP libraries other than of course, deep learning libraries. So um, Spacey is, basically this open source NLP library that provides a lot of utility for um, pre-processing and also pre computing machine learning on text. So Spacey actually has built in machine learning models to do things such as named entity recognition or part of speech tagging and like more than that. So if you don't know what named entity recognition is, it's basically the idea of like going through a sentence and then looking and, and basically getting, extracting like proper nouns or extracting like, um, basically just like named entity. So if like, let's say you had a sentence that says um, DS3 is hosting a NLP workshop tonight, right? In that sentence, the name, one of the named entities named in that sentence is DS3, right? It's a proper noun that we want to extract from that sentence. And this can be useful because you maybe want to um, analyze, you know, like what politicians, what major figures, what celebrities is a sentence talking about, you can add, you basically can identify that with named entity recognition. Part of speech tagging is basically another type of machine learning that's covered in Spacey where you can um, go through and you can basically process a sentence and then um, assign a basically part of speech label to every word, right? Is this a noun? Is this a verb? Is this an adjective? Um, Spacey does that automatically for you, which is pretty so really, really cool and really useful if you can figure out how to incorporate that in whatever project you're doing. Natural Language Toolkit, NLTK, is another NLP library that's um, that provides like a lot of pre-processing utilities. It's mainly used for pre-processing more than anything else, but it also does include some machine learning um, capabilities like Spacey, but I do believe Spacey is like just considered better for machine learning, so just keep, take that with a grain of salt. And then Gensim is the last library. So this library is mainly built for building like search engines and doing document retrieval, but it also provides models for, you know, topic modeling and like um, similarity uh, retrieval, which basically, uh, they basically, that's, those are sorts of like utilities you'd want if you want to build search engines, if you want to build um, recommendation systems, stuff like that. Oh, and also um, somebody also asked in chat, what's the difference between supervised and unsupervised machine learning? So um, I should probably should have covered this earlier. That's my bad for not, you know, putting this, this in this, these slides. Um, but unsupervised machine learning is the basically like 
Uh, I think the big easiest way to describe it is that unsupervised machine learning takes unlabeled data and tries to find patterns in it. And supervised machine learning takes labeled data and then tries to, um, you know, make predictions using, like basically tries to learn the patterns of the data to make predictions using those labels. So unsupervised machine learning is all about find, like just, you know, autonomously finding patterns without those labels, if that makes sense. Now, I guess we can then move on to um, language modeling here. So language modeling is basically a, another type of task done in NLP. Um, basically, it's the idea of taking a sentence Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, you're good. All right, sorry about that. So um, I guess we will start from the beginning of the slide. I don't know how much you guys heard, but language modeling is the idea that you guys want to basically use ML or machine learning techniques to predict, try to predict what's the most logical word that comes next in a sentence. So you said, for example, you have this sentence right here, the students open their blank and then uh, the model will basically try to predict what word makes the most sense to come next. So books, laptops, exams, minds, these are what the model predicts makes the most sense in the sentence. And language modeling might be the single most important um, task, sorry, it might be the most important uh, like task in NLP. And yeah, exactly. And uh, con uh, had it nailed down. This is exact like language modeling is exactly what you guys see in your um, in autocomplete, for example. If you guys are typing on an Android or iPhone phone, right, and you guys are typing a sentence, right, and it's trying to predict what word's going to come next, that's language modeling. That's what it is. So, um, language modeling, you know, is such an important task. It's basically used to benchmark most state of the art NLP research. So whenever anyone comes out with a new model or a new NLP technique, right, um, they will always benchmark against language modeling because it's um, because always a good language model is going to learn a lot about the language you're dealing with. It's going to learn about, about the syntax, the grammar, the vocabulary, the meaning of all the words in your in your language. And these are really, really good elements um, or these are really, really good, like, you know, things that we want are like are, are the computers to learn. So that's why language modeling is pretty important. And then obviously, I could, we just talked talk, talked about like how you language modeling is used in the industry. So language modeling is used for autocomplete. It's also used to create um, chatbots um, for all sorts of use cases. So next, we'll move on to um, some of the deep learning models that you would use for NLP. So um, guys, I'm kind of not going over too much deep learning in. I'm going to go over deep learning models, but I'm not going to go over too many of the foundations of deep learning on the slides just because we've have put together like plenty of other deep learning workshops. But if you guys have any questions about deep learning that, you know, be like that basically, like if you guys don't know certain things about deep learning models that kind of make it hard to understand these slides, please let me know and I can always clarify more. So recurrent neural networks basically are um, a type of neural network that are specifically really useful for analyzing text or basically variable length inputs. So if you know what a, if you know what a neural network is, a normal neural network can only process fixed length inputs, where whatever the whatever the size of the input you trained on is like the only size only size input that you can work with. So if you basically train a model to work with a 200 by 200 image, it can only work with 200 by 200 image inputs, nothing else. So that means every like image you want to put into your model, you have to convert to a 200 by 200 image before you can analyze it, right? So recurrent neural networks basically allow for a little more flexibility in your input where 
um, uh, you can basically process variable length inputs. Because the reason why we can't analyze sentences with normal neural networks is because sentences can be of all sorts of different lengths. A sentence can be a three-word sentence or like a 20-word, 30-word sentence, right? There's It can be anywhere in between. So we need to be able to, our model needs to be flexible. Now with recurrent neural networks, you can use basically any word representation we talked about. But if you want the best performance, it's typically recommended to use pre-trained word embeddings like we talked about earlier, as they result in the best performance. And um, what's also really great, great about uh, recurrent neural network architectures is that they can be customized to solve many different types of NLP tasks. So right here, this is a one-to-one -one architecture where um, we take a single input and then have a single output. So this is what would be considered a normal neural network where we take in an image and maybe try to classify like a label or a regression output. Here we have a one-to-many model. So a one-to-many model, what's useful for is um, something like image captioning, right? You take in an image and then you generate a sentence word by word that captions that image. Um, many to one, maybe you wanna do sentence classification where maybe you wanna do sentiment analysis, right? You take in a sentence, read in the words one by one, and then you um, output a classification or like a single value. Um, many to many, this would be mainly used for something like, um, what's it called? A machine translation. So maybe you input a sentence in French or a sentence in English word by word, and then you output a sentence in French word by word. Um, last but not least, we have many to many. Uh, no, sorry, another type of many to many where you're basically kind of producing outputs as you're processing words. So what this would be useful for is like part of speech tagging. We talked about earlier how Spacey does part of speech tagging. So if you basically process the words, I eat cookies, right? I would be a pronoun. It would out basically be classified as a pronoun. Eat is a verb. We classify this as a verb. And the cookies is a noun. So we classify it as a noun. So uh, these are just basically example like tasks you guys could use these sorts of RNN structures for. But there's obviously much more you could do with them. And they're really, really flexible. So RNNs, if you guys didn't know, um, were kind of created in the 70s and 80s. They've kind of been around for a long time and have been really, really popular ever since. But they do have some problems, which is why people are kind of like starting to lean away from them. So um, many of the computations or formulas that are in our recurrent neural networks are often too naive and can encounter these problems, such as vanishing or exploding gradients, which is basically the idea that when we're when our model is learning, um, we might encounter a point where we compute a gradient to be very, very close to zero or like a very, very large value. And that can mess up our training process because of just the nature, the way that the model's formulas were defined. So the way to avoid this would be to basically use a complex um, recurrent neural network variant, such as you know, gated recurrent units or long short-term memory modules or LSTMs, if you've ever heard of them. I'm not going to go too much detail about how these work because they are a lot more complex and require a little more math to understand, but you guys are more than welcome to obviously research or you can ask me questions later about it more. Um, another thing is also that RNNs actually must compute each word sequentially, which is slow and expensive, right? I was I showed back here this diagram that RNNs kind of have to classify, they basically process each word one by one. Um, and they, can, they can't just compute on the entire sentence all at once. So to solve this, researchers created basically a transformer model, which basically builds off of um, con convolutional neural networks that are designed to process images. They basically took the ideas of those sorts of models and applied it to text to create transformers. So what is a transformer? So a transformer is a new type of model that's um, heavily used for natural language processing tax tasks, but it can be used for things that aren't NLP, um, if you know how to like customize it well. So transformers basically compute an entire input or an entire sentence simultaneously speed up prediction by using basically you know parallel processing and using your GPU to its like um, best like uh, ability. So the main component of a transformer is it uses something called multi-headed self-attention, um, and what it does, what multi-headed self-attention does, is it basically takes in an in some input word embeddings and then contextualizes them. And what contextualizing means is it allows word embeddings to basically encode um, information from its context into it. 
so I kind of talked about earlier how like, you know, words change meaning depending on the words surrounding them, right? This is a pretty important property of the English language and language in general. So um, in order for, you know, um, com compu sorry, computational models to also, you know, um, kind of uh, account for that fact, they, they basically created multi-helid self-attention where if this is kind of a sentence in French they have as an example here in this diagram, but it takes in um, these three word embeddings, inputs into multi-headed self-attention, and then outputs contextualized word embeddings, where basically the word embeddings are modified to also have, you know, um, additional information encoded onto them. So it's a pretty complex, like, you know, um, like uh, math formula. And if you guys are more interested in learning more, I do have some resources at the end you guys can learn about for that stuff. So another reason that transformers are really, really important, guys, is that um, a lot of the transformers that people use in the industry today are pre-trained. And what that means is, you know, companies like Google, companies like OpenAI have trained these models on like um, millions of GP, not millions, like thousands of GPU hours, right? On like terabytes of data. So these models are already refined to a very, very precise level. So you can basically take them out of the box and it, they typically work pretty well, but you can also train them even further, you know, when they're already pre-trained and it saves you a lot of time, saves you a lot of energy. And typically these pre-trained models also perform really, really well for most of your techs. Um, techs. So, bi -direct, so basically the first type of um, model, bi-directional representation to transformers or BERT, um, is a model developed and used by Google. So it came out, I think about now, it's been, it's about two years old now, I think this model. Um, it is definitely the most popular NLP model used in industry. It's literally used for everything. Like it, in the original BERT paper, it was used for language modeling, but like it's used for so much more than language modeling now for all sorts of different other tasks. Um, and then I, to put it also into context for you guys, like um, Google, after developing this model, I think they realize how powerful it is, right? Only like six months after I think releasing the paper, Google started really integrating BERT into their entire tech stack. So, um, you know, Google Translate started using it. Google Search, the search engine actually uses BERT now um, to basically retrieve like, you know, web pages. And I'm sure that many other components or many other, you know, um, like, you know, products in Google use BERT. Um, so it's used there. I also know someone who works at Twitter, for example, he works as a machine learning engineer there and they actually use BERT for, um, uh, for they use multiple different models of BERT trained for different tasks to basically handle tweet recommendations, you know, like the tweets you guys would see on your homepage. Those are all provided by BERT. So um, uh, I guess you also, Neil had this question, would you use distill BERT if you don't have much cloud compute? Yes, so distill BERT is another type of um, BERT model that's basically like, I wanna say it's like less than a quarter of the size of BERT, but only loses like, I think less than 1% accuracy in performance. So Google engineers basically kind of put some more effort into compressing BERT to st by, but still wanting to maintain performance. And when, they comp when you compress BERT, right? When you make it smaller, you make it easier to compute and easier to train, right? So this can be deployed to, um, you know, your phones for, app, for you can, it can be deployed to your phones, to web apps, all sorts of stuff. And yeah, um, these slides will be posted like in the discord and like on Facebook later. I'll also be uploading the, uh, the recording for this um, workshop on YouTube later. So another um, pre-trained transformer that's also, you know, um, pretty new, but also like getting popular is called, called GPT-3, developed by OpenAI. And if you don't know what OpenAI got, is, guys, it's also pretty, it's a really, really cool um, AI startup um, that was founded by uh, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, and a couple other like um, really significant, you know, Bay Area um, tech CEOs. So they had like a huge, uh, they had a lot of influx of money that funded them, but they're a really, really cool startup as well. If you'd also didn't know, they're the ones who created the AI that beat the human, the best Dota players um, with their AI. So that was them as well. So they also developed this model that's pretty, pretty new. So you can all check that out too. And I think that's it for me in terms of content. I'm not gonna go through this demo right now, but um, this is uh, basically some code I wrote 
that shows you if you want to use Distilbert to do like article classification, there's like a code snippet that would kind of demonstrates how to use it. Um, it's not too hard to use. It basically uses this like wrapper library called Ktrain, which makes it super, super easy to create vert. Like basically, right? This is all the pre-processing code I have up here, right? This can be, this pre-processing code looks at different for everyone, for every project, because everybody's data sets are always different, right? But this right here is, yeah, this right here is all the code you need to train Bert, these four lines of code. Um, it's pretty easy to do in this, um, in this library. So if you want to do some sort of deep learning project with Bert, it's actually a lot easier than you think, because a lot of the, you know, the models are already implemented for you. All you kind of have to do is like retrain them or, um, just use them for prediction, basically. So another thing is these are some references I used when I was like making these slides for um, explaining like the deep learning models about transformers. So if you want to learn more about how transfer learning works, which is like the idea of using a pre-trained model for a new task, or you want to learn about you know how BERT and transformers work, these blog posts like go into great detail with all these. That's this is actually where I got all the diagrams from. This, this goes into great detail about how it works and it's pretty easy to digest too, much easier than a research paper. So yeah, that's pretty much the end of the workshop, but you guys are obviously more than welcome to stick around. Um, I can stick around for a bit, ask like basically answer some questions, um, but you guys are free to go. Please also make sure to apply to DS3 committees. I talked about at the beginning of this workshop um applications are going to close in a couple of days but uh if any of you guys are interested in also joining my committee for workshops i'd be more than happy to um have you next year you guys can be basically putting on workshops like this next year for you know data science students here so yeah are there any ucsd classes you'd recommend to learn more about nlp so actually yeah i have a couple actually so 